Keep it 1,000. Keep it 1,000. Keep it a stack. Keep it a stack. We kill 1,000. Kill 1,000. It's deeper than rap. It's deeper than rap. It's the Keep It 1,000 podcast. It do not stop. It's the Keep It 1,000 podcast. It do not stop with me. This is the Keep It 1,000 podcast. Keep it, keep it, keep it. I'm stack. And I'm your host, Kill One Triple Zero. And as you can see, it do not stop. It do not stop with me. And I got a special guest in the building, man. Former gang leader, turned motivational speaker, turned activist, very active in a in a community, you know. I'm talking about the legendary Silky Slim in the building, man. What up? Hey man, what's going on, man? Thank you for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Man, look, I appreciate that, man. You keeping it 1,000, man. Getting back with me so we can make it happen. This legendary right here. I oh, mean, I like I I look at your work and what you have done, you know, and I've seen your movement with put the guns down when I was definitely active in the streets, um, first stop the killing. And that was an inspiration to see you uh go against the grain. So many people are afraid to go against the grain, you know what I'm saying? So I commend you for, you know, basically um that's the first time when I heard that put the guns down and, and it's a powerful uh statement because if some of these youngsters would put the guns down man they could see a brighter future you know unfortunately they're living in a world that has a gravitational pull on them and for them to try to even imagine what should be is impossible because of what they're living in so um, these are youth that we have to go after with every message that we can get man so i commend you for putting that message out there and the way that you put it out there was very powerful as well. Hey man, I just kept it trill. That's really how we came up. You know what I'm saying? We was fighting first and very seldom you shoot it out. You know what I'm saying? If you had a real big problem, not over this shit they shooting over right now. You know what I'm saying? You had to put them bitches down. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just keeping yeah, it Yeah, man. What's that? That these youngsters are using a permanent solution for a small problem. So many of them are going to the grave and to the penitentiary where a lot of them are not surviving in the penitentiary. I was recently speaking in a um, penitentiary and a young man came up to me and, you know, I could tell, you know, like, yeah, God, got, you know what I'm saying? He was like, Silky Slim, you don't remember me? I'm such and such. I said, yeah, I remember you, you know, and he knew that I was understanding that he had got turned out. And, he said, and I asked him, I was like, what happened? Because he was a real gunslinger. He said, well, you know, I think it was always in me and I was just fighting it and that's why I became so violent. No, it wasn't that because you couldn't get to that pistol. See you what know, I'm saying? Like, yeah. yeah, so that was an experience, man. It was a crazy experience because um, this was a true iron slinger. And so many of these youngsters are leaving the streets, committing themselves. Um, to a life of slavery is what prison is, is a life of slavery. Exactly. And there's no gratification, you know. I hate to see people glorify prison. And, yeah, I made it, I did this much time. That's because you was dumb. Right. You know what I'm saying? When you wake up and realize that prison is slavery, uh, man, it's a hell of an awakening. Because when I was in the prison system, I was hiding from work one day, bro. And um, you know, I'm looking around the tree trying to see when the man and the man came behind me on the horse. And I was kneeling down like, where he at? You know, and he put the gun behind my head, say, Read if I catch you not working again, I'll put a hole in you and stay to raise my goddamn pay. And when I looked up from the ground mm. and looked at on that horse, it reminded me of a root scene. I was like, damn man, I'm in slavery. And, and he I said never, the state gonna raise his pay. Yeah, and I never ever wanted to go back to prison from that day on. I went around on the compound telling people, man, we in slavery. They man, that nigga done lost his mind talking about we in slavery. Man, he you was working for pennies a day, man. And and you know, you hitting the field at five in the morning, you ain't coming out to three in the afternoon, you getting like 22 cents a day. That's slavery. And so many of us try to glorify that lifestyle. And I think the children and the youngsters have definitely adapted to that. Um, glorification. I hear rappers all the time. Um, oh, I heard one rapper from Baton Rouge say, oh, that's just in our DNA. That, that, that's how we get out. And, nah, we just ignorant. And you don't want to face the facts that you've been made a fool out of. Right. An old man told me one time, he say, son, 
it's more easier to make a fool out of someone than to convince them that they've been made a fool out of. Why? Because if you try to convince them that they've been made a fool out of, that hurts. Mm. You know, they'd rather go on and live a foolish lifestyle than to try to change their crazy ways, man. Right, man. It's a whole different story behind them walls. And they, don't, they ain't going to find out till they get there. Yeah, you know some got to go to know. Yeah, some got to go to know. So like I tell people, I don't try to assassinate your character or um, beat down your so-called accomplishments in the streets. I just try to warn you. That's on them to take the warning. They don't take the warning. That's on them. If you got to go to know, feel free. And when they get through working the hell out of you and going upside your goddamn head, then you realize ain't no real gangsters. One of the things I always notice in the pen, man, and um, two people could be fighting. And while you're fighting, you hear those keys coming down the wall. First thing they say is, here come the man. Here come the man. The man opened the door. Who fighting? Ain't nobody fighting. You scared to death. Mm. And when I noticed that, I was like, damn, if that's the man, then who the hell am I? I'm the slave. For real? And I didn't want to be in that position. So I, I, I walked away. And by the grace of God, since 1996, I've never looked back at the walls of any institution. And I just thank God for that. Man, you got a hell of a testimony, man. I'm glad to see you come from that. You know what I'm saying? Overcome that situation and doing positive things. Definitely. You know what I'm saying? And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the show. Yeah, most the last question on all my shows is any advice for the kids. I know you're going to have some gym. You know what I'm always, saying? Always, always, man. We lost connection on your picture. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, what I want to do is take you back from, you know, the early days growing up in Baton Rouge in the South Side and the bottom, man. What was it like growing up in the South back then? And it was rough, man. And, um, you know, as as a part of the South Side Wrecking Crew, which was Baton Rouge's official street gang in history, um, it was very rough. But one of the things that none of us realized is that something that we condoned in and took part in in ignorance would still be around 35, 40 years later. We didn't understand that back then. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't understand that we would have children and two parents that are best friends, um, two, their two children would be at war with each other. We didn't understand that you would have one in the casket with four down on his arm and another one that pulled the trigger with four down on his neck. We didn't understand that. Damn. We didn't understand. The thing about it, what they don't understand with the war that's taking place in South Baton Rouge now with um, the top and the bottom is that when you had the South Side Record Crew, we, we represented the whole South. Mm -hmm. We represented the whole South. Right. But you know, somebody took the fours that was down and they turned them up. And, and they separated it. Down, you got four up and it's separated. And in many of these cases that, that we've seen the havoc that was created was created by hood cowards, people that was getting beat up in the hood, people that was getting their chains took in the hood, and they got a little bread, and instead of um, taking the money and the success, um, they started to send hits and kill people. And that's one of the things that the individuals, you don't kill an individual hey, um, to, cut you to get rid kinda, of them. It's kind of dragging. Success. It's kind of dragging. Do you have anything else like hooked up to your Wi-Fi? You might that you could take off. It's kind of dragging. It's kind of lagging. Nah, that's the only thing that's running. Okay, okay. We'll. I'm. A, I'm gonna play with it. it. Let me make. Sure. And I edit it. Okay. 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 So we going back to uh, you know, coming up in the south and the same topic you was on. Yeah. And so many individuals that got caught up into this, when they see that they have haters, uh, people that have messed over them, they thought that the right thing to do was to eliminate them, get them murked or something like that. The right thing to do would have been to show them your success and make them bigger haters. If you ain't got no haters, you ain't done a damn thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that lesson, hard earned lesson. So um, we just have a blind generation that has created their own set of laws and that are basically at war with each other. This is a civil war that we see. And I am very adamant about letting these individuals know that 
you know, this is real life. Now, what really gets to me is that we could have the hood killings and nobody says nothing, but if a white man come out there with a badge on or a white man kill a black man, then it's Black Lives Matter. Damn it, it got to matter to that person before it mattered to anybody else. That's the hypocrisy of it, is that we want to fight and no justice, no peace when the white man do it, but we'll do it to each other all day. That's the hypocrisy, man. We got to change that attitude. We got to really get to loving black people. You know, in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s, when you seen a black man, the first thing that came out your mouth was brother, because that white man had his foot so far in our ass, right. we was happy to see each other. Shit, Woo! shit. You know what I'm saying? But now that they done bagged up a little bit, we done became our worst enemies, and we have to turn, 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 turn the station on that man and get back to loving each other and seeing black folks for what they are. You know, if I was to see you in the streets and I was to walk on your feet, your feet ain't gonna say nothing, your mouth would. Why? It's connected to a nervous system. Mm. And when I walk on your feet, your mouth, ouch, man, hey man, you're on my feet, because it's connected to a nervous system. That's the way that we have to be connected to each other. When I see something happen to you, it pains me enough where I wanna get out here and do something to stop that from happening to you. So we have to have that all the way across the board, else we're just spinning our wheels. And right now, Unfortunately, that's what we've been doing for some years now, just spending our wheels. Yeah, it's a lot of lost individuals, definitely, man. Misguided, you know what I'm saying? Thinking Most the definitely. wrong thing is the right thing. Exactly, right. exactly. You mentioned uh, y'all represented the whole South Side. How did you become like the founder of the South Side Wrecking Crew? Well, it's a difference in becoming a founder and being a founder and a leader. Like the Southside Record Crew was existent, was in existence when I came home from LTI. Damn. Like See, you don't really hear much about gangs and bad rules. That's why it was intriguing for me. Yeah, yeah. But it was already in existence when I came home from uh, Louisiana Training Institute, right? Okay. And yeah, and just me and Big Daddy, we just took it to another level. And that's what put us on a whole nother level because Southside Record Crew actually started off as some. Um, band members at McKinley High School and they was in talent shows and they was in that. Come and, on. And then when I came home, yeah, when I came home, Showbiz Pizza used to be real big. It was like a club, yeah. teen club. And we started going to Showbiz. We started fight with, with the park and Zion City. And that's what really kicked off the gang side of it. That's when it became known as something that people became feared of. Um, we started, you know, laying down and whip on them. That's that's how it became that for us. So it was already formed when I came home from LTI, which was like in 1985. And um, then it, it, it emerged to something bigger in 1986, 87. That's when it became the street side where it was known as a gang. Okay. So at 14, you get charged with attempted murder and armed robbery. You take us back a little backstory on that. An attempted murder, um, the armed robbery came from a, a neighborhood grocery store that me and a group of uh, friends had went into and called OJ's Food Mart. I never forget the name of it because I almost lost my life there. Mm. And, you know, we hustling and we went into the food mart and um, we tried to stick them up, you know, and the guy was just sitting there. He was sitting there behind this thing with a newspaper, you know, behind the counter with a newspaper. We walk around the store and all of us pull our guns out, like, give it up. And he stood up and said, motherfucker, this is what I've been waiting for. Mm. And he shot my homeboy in the face. Ooh. I shot in the face. And um, that left us scrambling, you know, like, damn, you know, we ain't know he had no eye back there. So um, we ended up running off. We ended up getting caught. And I ended up going to LTI for that. But the attempted murder came at a high school game at McKinley High School against Glen Oaks. And mm. um, Zion Merch was there. We had got into it inside the game. When they came out the game, you know, we had ended up shooting two of them. And um, I ended up going to LTI for that and um, doing time at LTI for that shooting. So that's that was that was, that was the beginning of a real uh, nasty down toil that I had in my life. But I mean, I always look at it, you know, it, everything has to have meaning to it in order for it to help you in life. And one of the things that I realized is that Louisiana Training Institute was exactly that. It was an institute that was training you, but training you for the wrong thing. I can remember one day 
in the dormitory getting into a fight. And um, I kind of like ducked my head a couple of times. And the free man that worked there, when I got through fighting, he called me to the desk, said, come here, Reed. I said, what's up? He said, man, you can't be ducking your head like that. You go up there, uh, up that road up there, and you be ducking your head, you have a man. So keep your head up and make sure that you uh, always look at what your target is. Right. He wasn't telling me fight. It was teaching us to fight. But right. they was telling us, when, not when you go home, when you go up that road. Yeah, like saying, was, yeah. That was a seed that was planted in my head. Now, you go on the penitentiary because he didn't told you. Mm. And then I tell people all the time, man, like we talk about the violence in the streets and we talk about uh, how we fight and kill each other, but the worst violence that any individual can encounter in their life is the intimate level of violence of speech from a mother. You ain't gonna never be nothing. You just like that no good nigga I had you for. When a mama tell you that, it's hard to shake that off. It's kind of brainwashing. You know, that, yeah, here, here goes somebody telling you, man, you can be anything you want to be in life, but in the back of your head, you still hearing your mama. You ain't gonna never be nothing. Right. And and they, they got any parents I see do that today. And that, you know, that's a hard thing. Another thing that I, I really wanted to touch on you with is that I was recently speaking in Washington, D.C., and um, they asked me if I could change one law in the world, what would it be? And I said, well, I really wouldn't allow children that's under 12 years old to go see their parents in prison. And everybody's like, whoa. They're like, well, why would you change a law like that? Why would you make a law like that? I was like, because that affected me. You know, on Sunday mornings, my mom would get us up, put on the best clothes that we had, and we will walk out the door. Many people would think we were going to church, but we wasn't. We were going mm. to Angola. So mm. we're going to see family members in Angola. And you got to keep in mind that this time, my, my mom was getting $227 worth of food stamps a month. That was it. That was it. Mom was on drugs, and she would sell some of the food stamps. So sometimes we didn't have nothing to eat. So you, hey, mom, I'm home. Get your ass in the bed. Right. You know, and you go to bed. Now, when I got to Angola, uh, Ma, I want some chicken. I could get chicken, ice cream, soda. You'd be like, damn. And I had the mind that um, my people that was locked up was living better than me. And then, if you ever been to Angola, they got some trees in the front of Angola. LSP is what it stands. It stands for Louisiana State Penitentiary, right? Right. And when I seen those trees, when I was a little boy, I was sitting in the back of that car and I seen those trees. That blew my mind. I say, damn alphabet trees and Come then on. when i seen when i seen how clean the penitentiary was and seeing the big lakes and all of those things man it just looked like a much better place than the bottom looked to me and i was receptive to going to prison because to me it looked better and you got to think about it i got on some raggedy levi's and holes in my pro kid tennis shoes and then i see my my people step out there with brand new white converse on starch down jeans they looking better than me i'm like damn so yeah. i really didn't give a damn about going to prison because i had painted a picture in my mind that it was a better place than where I, the hell that i was living in in the bottom bro okay so you did end up going to angola louisiana state penitentiary how long were you in angola well all of my time was Inside of the um, Louisiana Department of Corrections, I did seven and a half years inside of the Louisiana Department of Corrections. And what happens is that you get shipped around so much, but it was a seven year, I had like a 15 year sentence. I ended up doing like seven uh, years total. And I came home and I, I just came home with a different mindset. You know what I'm saying? I came home um, not glorifying it. Right. I came and wanted to make change. and that change came over a long period of time, but um, through intercessions and through God working with me, those changes was made and it's helping to be to become the person that I'm becoming right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, I, got, um, I got some questions on that too. I'm just trying to get from beginning to the transition. Yeah, transition, yeah, most Right, definitely. so now I uh, researched, you was a, a member of the LA, uh, rolling 30s crip gang yeah i was uh, how did I that was, come about uh, when I, I, in 1987 i moved to um los angeles 
And it was just, it, it, I mean, going from hood to hood, you know? And um, I always tell people, um, I just was involved with a young lady. Uh, she's a, a Delta, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, she always tries, you gotta denounce the Crips. I say, I never denounce the Crips because when I vowed, I vowed my life to that, you know? And right now, you know, just an hour ago, I was hanging with some Crips. That's that, that's my homies from way back so you then. Was, okay. So you moved from Baton Rouge to Cali? Uh, yeah, yes, I moved okay. from Baton Rouge to Cali, yeah. And I mean, I got friends, you know, that we, we've been in the same organization for over 30 years now. And, and you know, we made it to different levels, you know, and we, we never say, well, I was this, or I was that. I'll always be a part of the South Side. I'll always be a part of the Crips. Uh, those are the things that I was crazy enough to put my life on the line for. So I'll never just denounce that. I couldn't get her to denounce her Delta. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. And, and I was trying to show her. I was like, well, look, you a Delta. Y'all, y'all similar to us. Y'all got colors. You wear red. Y'all give gang signs. You know what I'm saying? So. It, you know, organizations are organizations. And I think being a part of, of the organizations that I have been a part of and um, learning experiences that I got um, gives me just as much knowledge as some people that carry degrees, you know? Mm-hmm. So I would never, ever talk bad on it. And I always tell people, like, I, if I was you, I wouldn't go into it. You know what I'm right. saying? I've been shot so many times. I tell people not to go into that lifestyle. It's not a lifestyle that I promote as far as um, something that I would tell um, my son to become a part of, right? But it's something that I did, and I I can't say that um, I'm sorry that I did it. You know, I don't have remorse about it. I have remorse about some of the things that I've done, of course. Right. But as far as me um, just downrading the organization, no, they got a lot of great people in those organizations, a lot of people that have came out of there um, that are very famous. And, and, you know, it's all about what you look for when you're there and what you get out of it. You know, it's just a way, it's a way of life. You know what I'm saying? So I don't, I don't deny it like that. Or I don't try to tear it down. I love many of my people that are still out there. I just wish that they would change their lives as well, you know? Right. So you mentioned like, uh, two dudes being from the same set, one tatted with the same tattoo on his arm. He got the same tattoo on his neck. Like far as the crib situation with like Nipsey Hussle, it being somebody, now I don't know how true it is, but the research said he was in the Crips too to do that to him when he kind of made it out. How do you feel about that situation? Nipsey's from rolling 60s and um, Shitty Cuz is from rolling 60s. but there, there are different things um, that you have to do to really analyze what happened to Nipsey. You know what I'm saying? I mean, um, from what I understand, which I haven't researched too much into, um, Nipsey was telling him, you know, get your paperwork. Somebody say he was a snitch or something. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Street code, you know, the street code has always been like, if, if you feel like somebody's a snitch, you smash them. And the, and the street code also is that if somebody calls you a snitch and you're not a snitch, you smash them. So, right. you know, you have to look at those different things from all angles. You know, when you're looking at it, you can't get fortunate loss for us. But at the same time, you have to always uh, have a mentality to separate yourself from those type of situations when you're out there, especially when you're living above um, some of the individuals that's, that's around you, you know what I'm saying? And um, for him to be caught up in a situation like that was super unfortunate. And sometimes that we just can't get everything out of us that we need to get out of us to change our lives. You know what I'm saying? That's why I thank God for the nation of Islam because it gave me the discipline to separate myself from a lot of things that I needed to separate myself from. And it keeps me on a course where uh, I understand that there's still people out there that's not pleased about the changes that you make. You know what I'm saying? But um, you have to have that faith. And, and that's what I, I really admire about this generation of individuals. I tell people all the time, um, preachers and other individuals, you know, everybody always, what's wrong with the youth? What's wrong with the youth? What's wrong with the youth? I look at them and I always let them know it's, it's the first three letters of the word. That's the real problem. 
why oh you what's wrong you. with you you scared to go after them right. what's wrong with you if you can't talk to them what's wrong with you is what's wrong with you is the real problem you know what i'm saying and at the end of the day when i talk to one of these youngsters in the streets i see something in these youngsters that i don't see in this older generation i see a little fire burning in their eyes that they willing to die for what they believe in and these old Negroes ain't even willing to die for what they say they have faith in. So when you see a generation like that, this is a Joshua generation. They just have the war pointed at the wrong individuals right now. The war should be towards the enemy of God and they're at war with each other. So um, that knowledge has to be brought to them. And once that knowledge is brought to them, um, I think that we'll see a greater generation than we ever seen in our existence here on this earth, period. Most definitely. Now you made some music back in the G. Now I sold my soul to the hood. Was a tape you dropped in '94? How you started making music? Um, I mean the music scene wasn't like it is now. We were like pioneers for the rap game in Louisiana. Um, Bottom Posse, CeeLo, um, Max Manelli. You know we were pioneering this thing. He mentioned and you. We went through. Yeah. Yeah, it was hot that we went through that. Um, these youngsters didn't have to go through you know what i'm saying because rap was being banned and we was rapping one day police come hey they can't rap they can't rap you know the mayor said they can't rap the chief of police said they can't rap so we had, we went through all that kind of stuff uh back in, in those times right there and um that was my second album that was actually a west coast album i was living in cali my first album was sagging straight from hell and okay. uh, it's funny that you brought the music up uh Bottom Posse consists of me, Joker P, Walter T, uh, KV, Die Can, X Con, and our first hit that got us signed to a, a record label was a song called "I Feel Like Killing the Nigga." Right. So what label y'all signed? That with? song became we were signed with Sony, Red, and uh, Itchy Bond Distribution. Uh, it's the same label that signed MC Breed um, mm. at the time. Breed had Ain't No Future in Your Front. And second people they signed was MC Nero, and then they signed Bottom Posse. Okay. And um, the thing about the song, and that song still comes up a lot in my career, I feel like killing a nigga, especially when I'm out saying that we got to stop killing each other. You might have some white jokers jumping in. It's just the same rapper that was talking about killing yeah. a nigga. But... What happened, Kel, is that the song was so big to one day I was walking on State Street near LSU, right? Mm -hmm. White boys came by and they was in a um they was in a Bronco. They had this Confederate flag on the back of the Bronco, right? They was bumping my shit. <laughs> one, of them, one of them hung out the truck and I feel like killing a nigga. Oh no. Boy, I was like, damn. Yeah. I was like, damn. But he that's like crossing over. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, damn, you can't say that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I went to music treasure chest. OG's gonna know what that is. It's a music store on the KD through. I know about it. I'm 39. You know, I've been out yeah. here a little bit, but you know. And, and the twins, the twins say, man. Come back at four o'clock, man. I want to show you some of your fans. And it was a group of white boys from Pride, Louisiana. That'd be the and biggest he, supporters, bro, if you think. Yeah, Tell him. yeah. I was looking, you know, and he said, hey, 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 hey. Tell Super Slim on what song y'all like. They said, oh, we like that killing a nigga. Like, <laughs> and, and but, you know, even now, with the way that the music is with all of the killing of the ops and you know, uh, we catch the op, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. It's a bed for the racist society to feed off of, you know? And I think that we have to do better in the music that we're producing. And it's hard to say that because, you know, you got to really understand the music industry is only so many that's gonna make it anyway. You know right. what I'm saying? So you got 27 major stars at any given time. Mm -hmm. You're only going to find 27 of them. So you're talking about like Jay-Z, Rick Ross, 
you talk to the major stars. You and they lasted that people. long. You know what I'm saying? To, yeah. To say so, they, yeah, the longevity. Inside, inside of that 27, then you got what, you know, so, you know, you got your superstars and then you got your rappers, you know, so they the rappers keep the industry going because they make it some money, but the superstars make the mega bucks. You know right. what I'm saying? But how many of us are going to make it to that big stage is what we have to try to contemplate on. We've had something that was real lucky, especially coming out of Baton Rouge. You know, we had some some real good talent, um, but the poison that we fed to the community, we've seen the remnants and the, the, the effects of that as well, with so many people losing loved ones and uh, individuals that's going and being lost and, and killed, you know. So when you look at that and your success is the way that it is, and you got so many homeboys that's in the ground. It's really not a success story. It's really a story of terror. Right. And once we see and wake up to that, man, we have to change the the what we're putting into the music right now because it's, it's, it's just the ongoing continuation of foolishness and individuals losing their lives. And it doesn't hurt any different when a mother lost, son is lost to the streets than when he's lost to the police officers. It's the same hurt. So what, at that time, what... uh kind of stopped the music career from that point what made what made the music stop um the last album i had is 2008 uh, that's the super slim little boost to keep it gutter um and that was in 2008 and i found myself like um uh, 35 years old i'm still making music i'm making money but i can't continue that that route you know and um the messages were not what God wanted. And, you know, once I became a part of the nation, I couldn't continue to spit the same kind of garbage that I was spitting. It's impossible to put garbage in and not get trashed out. You know what I'm saying? So, so I had to- When you go too. back and listen to, I feel like killing a nigga. When you go back and listen to, I feel like killing a nigga, what's your first thought? Painful because uh, it was it was something that I put into the universe. You know, and I've, I've been behind the gun before um, going through some dirt. And I never, ever put in Jesus keep me there to cross. I put in something that was going to buck me up. You know what I'm saying? So I understand the power of music as well, you know. So um, it's painful. And it's something that I have fought to really uh, take off the market at all costs uh, to keep it off the market. But I don't control the rights of my first two albums. I don't control the rights of those albums. So... I have no control over that, but you can't really find ghetto tears or, or, or keep it gut or pop me to stop me. You can't really find those albums out there because that's under my record label and I haven't distributed any of that stuff on streaming services or anything. Okay. Well, I got a segment in my show, man, where I say it's time to keep it 1000. And I'm giving free promo to anybody who's doing anything, any business. Hey, leave a comment, a brief description that. of what you got going on, and I'm going to shout you out. It don't take but a second to keep it a stack. So today's shout out goes to Troy Dumboy, an up and coming comedian, actor. If you need a laugh, go to his page. Follow him at Troy underscore dumb. That's D-U-M underscore boy, B-O-I-I -I underscore. That's how that go. So what was the turning point that brought you out the streets? Didn't you have like a wreck or something? Yeah. Um, that was part of it. So many things that played a role in me coming out, but um, 2001, a group of me and my partners were going to LA and um, it wasn't just no wreck. It was just like God was showing me that he was in control of how things turn out in the end is what I can say to make sense. Uh, I got a call, things were getting dry, it was a drought, we need to make a run. And we jumped on the road, headed to Los Angeles in the Tahoe. And um, we got to El Paso, Texas, which is a long stretch from Louisiana, right? Mm -hmm. And got down to go get something to eat. And when we got down to the bottom of the interstate, same way that I'm talking to you right now, I can hear a voice like that in my head. Say, look at that sign. I'm like, damn, where that come from? I looked out the window, and there was a billboard and it had a car. It was all crushed up 
on the billboard. It was a real car that they had heist up there. And at the bottom, it say, everybody wore a seatbelt, everybody lived. I never wore a seatbelt in my life. Right. But that scared the hell out of me. I put the seatbelt on, talking to them. I was like, man, y'all seen how that car was towing up there? Like, man, man, what's wrong with you, man? You tripping. I was like, nah, man, something told me to look at that. Dang. We went to L.A., got the drugs, party for a couple of days. And, um, you know, I just had a feeling of death on me um, when I went to get the drugs person that I was getting them from, man, it was like this. And he was reaching in his pocket for his beeper, and I grabbed him, wrestled him with him. He's like, man, what you doing? I said, man, what you got? What you got? My damn beeper. Yeah. I started crying, bro. I say, man, I say, I'm getting ready to die, man. I say, I know what it means when they say somebody was fearing their death. I say, I feel my death. I say, I, I know heard I'm people ready. say, like, I feel death on me. What is that, like, yeah. chills or something? Like, what? No, man, it's it's a feeling like um like your 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 meat is being pulled away from your bones. Mm. Like in this eerie feeling, like 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 your flesh is being pulled off of your bones, bro. That's how it feels. That's deep. And it is my belief that you get that feeling because the deaf angel is around. And I just kept telling them, man, I man, I feel my death. I feel my death. And you know. We cry together and like, man, homie, you gonna make it back out here. I like, man, I don't know, bro. I'm telling you, I feel my death. We got back, jumped on the highway, and um, I put my seatbelt on. We rolling, and it's eleven o'clock at night. You know, I'm tired. I let the seat back, took my seatbelt off, and grabbed the blanket and covered up. That same voice came back. Put it back on. Look outside. Dang. Faced up and looked outside. It was drizzling. I say, man, Al, slow down, man. It's raining out here. Click my seatbelt. He said, man, I ain't got time to hear that shit, bro. He said, I got to get back and pay my taxes. January the 11th. He said, I got to get back and pay my taxes. And instantly, an 18-wheeler switched lanes and hit the front of the tower and knocked us over the side of the mountain. Everybody died except me. Everybody died and, but you. And when I got out, you know, I, I took the seatbelt off and climbed out the truck. Look, the wheels were still spinning. That same voice. I brought you out of that. What you gonna do for me? So you and was that started, walk out like just get out. Yeah, I was scratches. I have, you wasn't hurt. I didn't have a scratch. Everybody Damn. else was dead. I didn't have a scratch, bro. And um, the boy said, "I brought you out of that. What are you gonna do for me?" And I was in the middle of the desert. This was in the middle of the desert. This place called Pearlville, Texas. If you look it up on the map, it's right outside of San Antonio, mm. and um, I was in the middle of the desert and nobody was around. A white guy stopped and he asked me what happened. I said, man, 18 Willow ran us off the road. My friend's down there. He drove off. And I said, damn, he left me out here, but he didn't. He went to the mile marker and got the mile marker and came back and he called the police. It took the police about 45 minutes to get to where we was because we was in the middle of the desert and I watched them the breath go out of them and it was just an experience that I had and I ended up staying at a hotel that night, flying back into New Orleans. And I went to my friend's house, and spent the night. And um, when I woke up the next morning, you know, all his family members and stuff was over there, you know, and I came in the living room and I was sitting down and the house got real, real quiet and eerie. And I asked them like, what's wrong with y'all? And they said, we want to know how our people did and you still alive. Mm. And that started, that started something that, they called the state troopers and told the state troopers that I had set the wreck up. And the state troopers called and was talking to me. I was like, nah. He said, no, we know you didn't set the wreck up. You didn't know if you was going to live. But they right. saying y'all was on the trip. And I was like, nah, we went out there looking at some property, blah, blah, blah. So I'm at my house. I'm ducked off. Because they thinking I'd kill their loved ones. And if I don't go to the funeral, it's going to look worse. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I go to the funerals. Um, I go and I'm um, back at the house. I'm in my backyard. I'm fishing, right? I catch a little bitty perch. I take the hook out of his mouth and throw him back in the water. And that fish got to jumping on top of the water. And man, that aggravated me like nothing else in my life had aggravated me. I started crying and I prayed, man. I was like, Lord, I don't want to see nothing else die. I'm sorry. Please let the fish live, and, you know. And I heard that voice again. And the voice was like, watch the glory of the Lord. 
Mm. And I watched the, the fish just kept flopping, 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 flopping. I got mad and broke my fishing pole. Say, <laughs> damn, man, I the Lord talking to me again. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Out of nowhere, out of nowhere, man, a white bird came. You know the white birds that be on the side of the road? One yeah. came and snatched the fish up out the water like, bloosh. Come on. And when he snatched the fish up out the water, I said, wow. I was like, man, that's a good one. I say the dying fish fed the hungry bird, so it didn't go to waste. Right. That same voice, that same voice came back and say, How can you have so much mercy on my smallest creature yet go out and try to kill my greatest, which is man, every day? I put mm. my gun down, and I never picked it back up. Man. And that was the change that brought me into what I do now. Man, that's deep. I ain't lying. Boy. Yeah. So it's unbelievable, but it's real. It's real. Yeah, I put now, my gun and I never look back, you know. You started Stop the Killing or you the yeah, president of Stop, Stop the Killing the Inc Inc Incorporated. Stop the Killing Incorporated. Yeah. yeah, I started Stop the Killing, man, and that was aimed at helping youth to um get out of the street life and try to save themselves, you know. And um uh, we've helped um uh, a lot of youth some things that we do at Stop the Killing go unseen. Mm -hmm. Um I could definitely tell you for sure that we have put four individuals with full scholarships through college, full scholarships, mm -hmm. you know, not no place with full scholarships through college, through an individual that I work with on um, that, that, you know, always gives when it comes down, if they got the grades, he'll get them that scholarship. So those young men, they know the role that I played in their lives. And I don't do this for, people to see what I'm doing. I do it because God has me doing it. Right now we're stuck in a world where individuals look for what's popular and likes. My thing, I, I try to do as much work as I can. And, um, you know, it, there's a saying in the Bible that says that to um, seek favor with man is to have enmity with God. That means be at war with God if you seek favor with man. So I never try to seek man favor. And that's why I, I've been bold enough to say some of the things that you may have heard me say when it comes down to being an activist and walk the walk they that I walk that. because I know that, yeah, God is, is pushing what I'm doing. So that's why I stay on the path that I do. Now to Stop the Killing, it was a DVD out, man. It was like a real reality check. I don't know if that's the name of it, Stop the Killing. Man, where they can get that at? Oh, it was uh To Live and Die in America. Yeah, on Amazon. It, man. It's crazy. Look, I got a stack of them sitting right here, bro. Bro, I want to really show, I got a 13-year-old son. I really want to show him. It was the one where they were showing, like, the bodies and everything on there. Like, oh, yeah, it's uncut. I mean, yeah, it's uncut. I, like, that's real, we, man. We, we actually had a chance to, on that DVD, and that shows you the path that God put us on. Talk to individuals about their death. Man, you think you're going to make it out alive? I don't know, man, because I'm going to have to leave it up to how I've been. Those are the words of Big Marquis. Rest in peace, man. Mm -hmm. And um, just in that documentary was an experience and a very painful experience um, because mm -hmm. I'm talking to somebody like, I'm talking to gangster and telling the man, look, man, y'all need to leave this beef alone, bro. Oh, Slim, I got my chopper. Same chopper he died with in his hands, you know. So mm -hmm. that was an experience and it was painful to put together, but it was a message that I had to tell by any means necessary. And um, that documentary still, it still moves, man. People still order it. Um, people lose it. People steal it from them. And right. they, they order it again, man. So, yeah, that, that's crazy that you would bring that up and it's sitting right there. People would think we set that up as a problem. Nah, I did my homework, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I want to bring yeah, up some yeah, shit that's yeah. real. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm trying yeah, to do. Yeah, Keep it yeah. 1,000 podcasts. Yeah, yeah but, uh, that was part two. You talked to Snoop, huh? Yeah, Snoop. The Living um, Dying in America, part two, I think. You, you, you talk to Snoop. Part one is part one is Young Jeezy and Dick Gregory. Um, part two is Snoop and um, forgot who the other people were, but yeah, we've been able to talk to uh, some real people. And you know, Snoop um, was doing a concert, and V90 um, took me over there to talk to Snoop, and I gave Snoop the documentary, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, like later on that night, like three, four o'clock in the morning, V called me again and said, man, Snoop won't holler at you. Went back over there and Snoop had everybody on his tour bus sitting down watching that documentary. I'm telling you, so, it's powerful. Like, hey, he was like, man, look, he was like, homie, look, you know, 
I ain't got to give you no money. He said, I'm going to give you me. And you make your money off of me. And that's how Snoop ended up on part two. Oh, yeah, that's 1,000. Yeah, that's 1,000. Yeah. I ain't lying. So how did you become like an activist? And what was it like, like being around some of the uh, activists that been around like Al Sharpton now? You know, um, when I was in prison, I was laying in bed one day and all kind of famous people just popped in my head. And I was like, damn, what was that? And at the time I was still in the rap game. I was working on the Keep the Gutter album. And I said, I know what that was. I'm going to go out there and blow up. I was like, and I went home. I was like, yeah, I'm going to blow up. I was like, I know what that was because it was all kind of famous people. And um, the album didn't do what I wanted it to do. And I never could figure out why those uh, pictures of those individuals had popped in my head. And I was in my office a couple of days ago and I looked on the wall. I seen Snoop Dogg, I seen Minister Farrakhan, I seen T.D. Jakes, I seen Steve Harvey, I seen Gail King, I seen all of the people that was popped in my head in my cell. And I realized that I was like, oh, I was like, man, God, that was a vision. I was like, you took me amongst all the stars. And that voice always comes back. I was like, well, the only reason that you're not a star is because you're always looking at who you take the picture with and not looking at yourself. Mm. So it was something that God did into. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that's that's something that you asked me if I have anything to tell the youth at the end of the program. I got to tell the youth that right now. Start seeing yourself in the picture. Ooh. I always looking at who I was taking the picture with. You know what I'm saying? Right. And we mark over everybody else's greatness and never take time to find ours sometimes. Right. So it's important for us to see ourselves in the picture. And all of those pictures that pop, I mean, I've met um, the greatest that have ever walked on earth from Dick Gregory to Minister Farrakhan, T.D. Jakes, Barack Obama. I've met the greatest. And Man. I've talked to them on different levels, you know what I'm saying? So it's been a blessing to um, have um, experienced all that I've experienced. Um, I miss Dick Gregory greatly because he poured so much into me. Right. Uh, young just asked me um, last weekend, how was it working with Dick Gregory? I say, well, when you're a man, it's rough working with Dick Gregory because he treats you like you're nobody. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He'll run you off. Get the hell on from around me. You ain't nothing but a goddamn fool. Damn. He'll come right back. I know you, man, but suck the shit up. Suck it up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you say you want to be goddamn it, this is what it takes. So, you know, it was a great experience. I had seven years with Dick Greg. Mm -hmm. Um, to sit down at the feet of Minister Farrakhan, the powerful black man in the nation, bro. Um, and have conversation with him. And he poured something into me and told me what my future will be and how I will be in the future. That's an act from God for me. You know what I'm saying? How, you get, how that, you get into the building with him? Routine. How you get oh, to man. that close to this I person, mean, like Farrakhan? Man, oh. it, was, it, was, it was just the work of God, bro. I'm sitting there and he's talking to me and, you know, and from that was the first time. So, you know, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Right. So I've met with the minister four times. You know what I'm saying? So it's it just, you know, the, he sees what, what I'm doing. He, he, he watches what I do. And he always, and you know how we, I, I always try to be truthful with the minister. Like, man, look, I'm with you, man, but my life's still not right. And the number one fight when we try to get our life right, man, the number one fight ain't putting the gun down, the cigarettes, the alcohol, the drugs. The number one fight is trying to put that woman down. You know yeah, what I'm man. saying? You're right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, man, I, that's, that, that's why, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, find that right individual and, and, and make that my, my, my heaven. You know what I'm saying? Find that one individual that's going to make me happy and make that my heaven. Definitely. But, uh, Working with all of those individuals has been an experience and it has been something that God really, really walked me through one um, person at a time. And I got all of these stories that I can tell, you know what I'm saying, from Shaquille O'Neal on down. I got all of these stories. So that's what inspired me to write the book that I'm writing right now to try to, you know, lay this out on the platform where it can make sense to individuals that you could be in hell and God can lift you out at any given day. You know, that's what right. I, I feel is. 
I feel that's super important. So how does somebody become an activist? Like what, what do you have to do? I can't tell you, like, it just happened for me. I, I, um, people um, have asked me, you know, how did you go to the next level? I don't know. God brought me there. I, I stand in front of colleges sometimes, get ready to speak, and be asking myself, what in the hell am I doing here? Yeah. I'm a seventh grade dropout. I'm a seventh grade dropout. And, you know, when you look at where I have been placed, is what I say, not where I am, but where God has placed me. I work every single day um, with what we call the black attorney general is Ben Crump. Um, for me to work with Ben Crump is nothing short of a miracle from God itself. You know what I'm saying? Who is Ben Crump that, for the people that don't know? Civil rights attorney that has um, taken up about 70% of all the police brutality cases in the nation. He brought the biggest um, lawsuit um, win with the George Floyd case. He did Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, uh, Baltimore John. One thing about us as black people, the first thing that we do is we hate on each other. So you got so many black folks that be out there. Well, he ain't never got none of the police arrested. He's a damn civil rights attorney. He's not a prosecutor. You right. know what I'm saying? He can't get police arrested. That's the prosecutor's job. So okay. he's a civil rights attorney. Civil rights attorney's job is to secure the bag. He's yeah. the one that go in and y'all did this wrong. Y'all need to pay this family so that the children can have something. Yeah. He the one that follows civil right lawsuits. That's all he can do. He don't have any power to get anybody arrested. So he's not a prosecutor. He's a civil rights attorney. And um, just to work with him on a daily basis is a blessing. Um, you said Al Sharpton, been a blessing. Um, and I, I, I always look at it. I look at it like this, that God has me following in the footsteps of so many great individuals until it's almost impossible for me not to become great in right. my life. Yeah, in my lifetime. That's how I'm surrounded by. Yes, yes. Every day. Every day. I'm, I'm I'm walking. I'm walking. Al was just here this morning. I'm walking with these individuals every single day. So um, you know how they say uh you want to be a millionaire, you gotta rub elbows with one. I'm right. rubbing elbows with great people every day. So I do believe that I'm gonna be great in the end. It's a struggle. Trust yeah. me, it's a struggle. It's not easy. You got to work I, at it. Yeah, and, and the struggle is not so much going out facing what we have to face all day. The trouble and the struggle is facing God and trying to be a godly man. And I, that's, that's where my struggle come in at. So, I, I'm, I'm, you know, you let the flesh take over. You won't even get out of bed and say your prayers. Right. You know, so, yeah, I'm, I'm study fighting this fight every day. I haven't won. It's just an everyday struggle, but I know that God has to still have his hands on me um, because he could have took me out in the wreck. He could have took me out when I got shot. Uh, I think that this is one of the greatest stories that God has created. And um, I have to discipline myself enough so that this story can be told. So that being said, what's next for Silky Slim, man? Biopic, upcoming projects, what's going on? Well, I got the book Fight For You coming out. Uh, I got the Fight For You documentary that's about to come out that tells the story of many of these police killings that have taken place in America. And um, right now I'm just focusing on the book. I think the biopic is going to come in time. I just don't think it's the time for it right now. But, um, you know, we got a couple of films we're going to be dropping. So we just stand grinding and, and making sure that we get the positive message out there. We just want to be a beacon of light for individuals that's been in dark. That's it. Nothing else big. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's God's plan, it ain't mine, so I'm working it one day at a time. That's how that go. Well, like mm -hmm. I said, uh, I always wrap up my shows with any advice for the kids. Basically, man, they out here lost, man. And I say kids, but they're 18, 19, 21. I still consider them kids. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Well, my advice for them would be the exact same thing that I just said. Start seeing yourself in the picture. Stop. Man, it kills me. Uh, when I hear a child say, uh, you know, they're trying to show you their talent, but then they um, put somebody else in the picture. Oh, I could rap like such and such. I could rap like this person. I could rap like this. I'm going to be the next. I'm going to be the next little one. I'm going to be the next this person. I'm going to be. Stop saying that. Whatever you, are, whatever you are should be bigger than anything that's ever been here. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Everybody want to be like somebody. So that's why you see them walking around, pants sagging, 
That's why you, I mean, we're in a mental state of slavery. Right. And first time you get some dollars, the first thing you want to go and do is donate some dollars to Gucci, Fendi, uh, all of these places that don't even want you wearing their damn stuff anyway. Create your own brand. Do your own thing. We you know, won't ever give up clothing <laughs> brand, man. Yeah, man, the craziest thing I ever seen, I'm writing about it in my book right now. If you can remember last year, right before the pandemic, um, Gucci put out a black face sweater. Right. And everybody went crazy. Mm -hmm. And then I watched T.I. come on the scene and was like, oh, hell no. We spent such and such, such and such millions a year. I'd be damned if y'all disrespect like that. We run the damn culture. When I seen that, I was like, mm hmm. I like, boy, T.I. is going to make a hell of a move because, you know, he got a cool clothing, right? Right. And a push for us to buy black clothing, and I'm going to support that. Yep. Next time I seen that damn fool he had on Fendi with all his family members. Oh, we went Fendi now. You know, nigga still a slave. <laughs> you know Damn. what I'm saying? So we got to get out the slave mentality, bro. We got to right. get out. Because I thought, sure, he was going to push his own clothing line, but the next picture I seen, he had his daughter, and he had his old lady. Everybody had on Fendi. And he was like, he was making a statement. I was like, uh, you ain't make the right statement. Because I was looking for you to push your own, man. And unfortunately, we feel like we have to have whatever they say is what's happening. We feel like we got to have that to be accepted. I'm just not that tight. And it ain't that I can't afford it. It's just that I have more sense than to go out there and spend money on some bullshit. And one thing that I've learned about life, period, you could put on any name brand that you want. You could dress yourself up. You could go get cut on and change your body. Until you change your damn mind, you ain't done a damn thing. Most of them are just dressed up mannequins, dumb as hell, and don't have anything up here. You 1, waste much on gold and platinum chains when you should be trying to create you a gold or platinum brain. And right. Everything, bro. Ooh, I ain't gonna lie. That's definitely some gems. Yeah. Man, man. look, I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on the show, man, taking time out your day, man. You definitely, the definition of it's never too late to change. You can change your life. You can be successful. You can guide your life to where you want it to be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is the yeah. Keeping 1000 podcast. I'm your host, Kel One Triple Zero. Silky Slim in the building, man. Y'all stay tuned to the next episode. Salute. Keep it 1000. Keep it 1000. Keep it a stack. Keep it a stack. We kill 1000. Kill 1000. It's deeper than rap. It's the Keep It 1000 podcast. It do not stop. It's the Keep It 1000 podcast. It do not stop with me. Keep it 1000.